Well, it is, that's loud. <laughs> but it is so good to be here, and not as a guest speaker, but to be here. Uh, we have been... We have been praying for this, looking forward to this day, and I, I can't wait uh, to move beyond where I'm like trying to put names with faces and where we are just family sharing life together. I'm, I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to being part not only of, of the Bridge Church, but being part of this beautiful community of Newberry Park. I've already learned that you don't go down the hill to Camarillo, you go down the grade to Camarillo. I, I look forward to when, you know, Siri says take a left on Reino to know if it's supposed to be Reno or Reno or I hear it's Reno. Is that right? I mean, there's all these things I just don't know yet, but I'm looking forward to being part of this community and just knowing this stuff and actually to not have to turn on my navigation thing to get from point A to point B anytime I just want to go get a taco or something. So I'm really looking forward uh, to, to being part of this church family and being family within this church and also being part of this community and also just seeing what God is going to do using this church family that he has strategically placed in this community where we together can make much of Christ for his glory and, and be a light to our community and, and, and extend throughout the world by, by God's grace, uh, the reach of this church. So we are excited to be part of it. Now this morning I, I wrestled, you know, it's always an interesting thing. What do you preach on uh, your very first Sunday when you haven't even been installed yet? I hope this one still counts, Bobby, even though the installation hasn't happened. Um, and honestly, it, it was a very easy decision. It's, uh, you know, I, I didn't even have to invest a ton of prayer into this because Colossians 1 just simply exalts Christ and, and gives us a, a, a very good insight into the supremacy, the preeminence of Christ. And I thought, what better place for us to begin as a church family together than just taking a few minutes to make much of Christ and to focus on the supremacy of Christ which I pray will be the foundation for each of our lives as Christ followers, but also who God will have us to be as a church moving forward. So let me just share a prayer together, and then we'll look at Colossians chapter 1. Father God, thank you for this time we have. Thank you uh, that we are here and that we're here together. And I, I'm just so excited about what you're going to do in this church family, in this community, and for allowing each of us to be a part of what you're going to do. Uh, here through the Bridge Church. And so, Father, we surrender this time to you. Uh, Father, as we just sang so beautifully, we long to just be in, in your presence, to uh, not come before you asking for what you can give us, but just simply to be in your presence. And I pray that as we spend time in your word this morning, uh, that that will be true, that we will know that we have spent time in your presence, exalting the risen Christ and sitting at your feet and just spending time in worship before you. So we we just want to say that we love you, we surrender to you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we think about, you know, focusing for a few minutes on the supremacy of Christ, it's important that we do so because it is so easy for us to drift away from a focus on who Jesus is. It's so easy for us to move beyond. Uh, for, for example, sometimes a crisis can come into our life, and at these times, whether it's you know, a, a, a pink slip or a diagnosis or a transition, all these things can happen that can cause us, if we're not careful, to, to lose sight that Jesus is reigning supreme over all of this. This community actually knows really well, don't you, about going through crises. If you look back over the last six months uh, to a year, a lot has happened here. And you've probably seen this, that sometimes a crisis situation can soften your heart and, and, and increase your dependency on the Lord. But sometimes a crisis situation can cause you to grow hard hearted and to drift away from a full appreciation of the supremacy of Christ, that he is preeminent, that he reigns above all of this. Sometimes it's not just a crisis, sometimes quite the opposite, complacency. 
can cause us to forget about the majesty and glory of the risen Christ. We can do all the right things. We can come to church every Sunday. We can sing. We can be in the Word. We can give. We can be in life groups. We can serve. We can do all of these things, but somewhere in the midst of doing all these things, we, we have drifted in our vision away from the supremacy of who Jesus is, and we lose sight of his majesty. Sometimes it's not just a crisis or, or complacency, but sometimes our culture, it just pulls us away. We, we kind of get sucked into the flow of our culture, and next thing you know, we, we've drifted away from fully appreciating and understanding who Jesus is and the majesty and glory of the risen Christ. So it's important for us to stop and to meditate and to focus on the preeminence of Christ, the supremacy of Christ. Those are big words to just say that he is the most important. And I want to make the case this morning that the most important thing about us is that we realize that Christ is the most important. That that's the most important thing about us, that we realize that Christ is the most important. And few passages declare that better than the one we're going to examine this morning. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians is an immensely practical book. He talks about, if, if we were to work through the whole book, you would see he talks a lot about being on guard against false teaching, not, not giving in to a teaching that was in some ways legalistic and in some ways uh, more spiritism, but he, he guards against, warns him to guard against his false teaching. He talks about things like how to honor the Lord in your home as a husband loving his wife, wife loving her husband, uh, even how to have effective ministry with those outside the church. Uh, you, you look at all these very practical things that are in the book of Colossians, and I love that he begins with this point. This is all based on the foundation of understanding the supremacy of Christ. This is not a conversation that should be relegated to dusty, stale theology books, the Christology chapter that you, that you turn to. This is immensely practical because this practical book is built on this foundation that it all begins with understanding who Jesus is, the glory of who Jesus is, and that changes everything. It really is true that the most important thing about us is that we realize that Jesus is the most important. Now, as we work our way through this, the first five verses, and this is where we're going to spend most of our time, 15 through 20, really just celebrate the supremacy of Christ. We're going to spend most of our time there. We're going to see that he is supreme over creation and that he is supreme over the new creation, the church. We'll see his role in redemption. And then there are a couple of verses at the end that talk about our response to the supremacy of Christ. So we're going to spend most of our morning just celebrating Jesus as supreme over creation and the church. Then we'll talk about how we respond to that. So let's just jump into this. Colossians chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 15. And again, these first few verses talk about his supremacy over creation. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now let's, let's work our way through this, because th this was rich. There's a lot we just read. It begins by saying he is the image of the invisible God that he is the representation of, of who God is, that when Jesus took on flesh and walked among us, that, that we were really seeing the revelation of who God is. This is because before time began, we, we, we use the term pre-existence, that being before creation, throughout all eternity past, Jesus existed as part of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, eternally existent in perfect community and loving relationship with each other. Jesus did not begin in Bethlehem. He, he was preexistent for all time, all eternity past with the Father, living with the Father as God, part of the Godhead. And this is where it starts off, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the invisible becoming visible so that we can see what God is like. 
And it's important to understand that he starts off by saying Jesus has always existed for all eternity as God with God because the next phrase can be a little confusing. That he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, if you just look at that, at first it sounds like there was a time when Jesus was born. I mean, in our context, when we talk about the firstborn, we generally mean the one that was born first. I have an older brother. He's the firstborn in our family. And, and there's actually a really old heresy that would take phrases like this and, and try to make the assertion that there was a time when Jesus did not exist and then he was, he was created before. I mean, the, the church dealt with this back in the early 300s. It's been dealt with a long time, but you still hear it sometimes. But you need to understand that firstborn in Scripture doesn't just mean the one who was born first. It has this idea of importance. Now, my older brother would like to think that that is still the case. <laughs> But no, that's not true. It's purely cultural. For example, in Bible times, the firstborn would receive a double share of the inheritance. They were just seen as more important. A, a good way to understand this, in Psalm 89, it writes a lot about God choosing David and exalting him as king. And there's a verse in there, Psalm 89 and verse 27, where God says this of David, I will make of him the firstborn, the greatest of all the kings of the earth. Now, David, as you know, was not born first. If you think through the story of David, uh, you may remember when the prophet Samuel came to anoint someone to be the next king, and they lined up all of the sons of Jesse, except for the, the, the runt of the litter, right? The kid brother was still out with the sheep. They didn't even bother to call. He's not, the, he's not born first. He's the youngest. He's the guy that's bringing the, 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 the bread and cheese to the battle, not the one fighting in battle because he's the kid. But look what God is saying. It's not that he is born first, but I'm going to make of him the firstborn, the greatest of all the kings. This is what this is saying. That it's not that there was a time when Jesus did not exist and then he was the first one to be born. That's not what this is saying. It's saying that Jesus is the greatest of all of creation, a theme that you'll hear a lot in this passage is that he is first because he was preexistent, but he's also the greatest, the first and the greatest. We'll see this three or four times in this passage. And notice it says he is the greatest of all creation. Now, when you see the word of, I want you to think here more of the idea of being above or over that he would be the firstborn, the greatest, over or above all of creation. And, and we use of in the same way. If, if we think about the president, we say that he is the commander and chief of the armed forces. What do we mean by that? We mean he's the commander in chief over the armed forces. So, so think of of in that phrase. And, and so here's what this gives us. That Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the one who for all eternity has existed as God and then made the nature of God visible. And he is the greatest. Over all of creation, over everything that exists, everything that has been created, Jesus reigns above as the first and the greatest above all of this. And then it tells us why he is the firstborn, why he is the greatest over all of creation, because we see the word for which means this, this is why, because, here's why he's the greatest, because by him all things were created. And if you were at all confused about what all things means, he spells it out. All things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities, all of these were created by him. So it's not just the physical things we see, but even the spirit realm. And then he gets into rulers and authorities, and you, you start thinking at this point of, of all the great leaders that have lived throughout history and that Jesus reigns above them. But it's, it's not just talking about human leadership. This is getting into the spirit realm of angelic beings, demonic beings, all these spiritual forces of, of good and evil. Jesus is the creator that reigns over them. And it says they were created by him. Then we see it was created through him. 
that when we read, let there be light, and there was light, and it was good. This is Jesus at work. And they were also created for him, by him, through him, and for him. So Jesus is not just the starting line of creation. It's not just that he was there, let there be light, but all things are for him. He's the finish line. This is the end goal of all of creation. And it keeps moving. Everything exists for his glory, for his pleasure, for his purposes. For, by him, through him, and for him. And it keeps going. And he is before all things. Once again, first and greatest. He is before. He existed before, and he's above. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So he's not only the creator, he's the sustainer. Okay, let's take a deep breath here because we just covered a lot. There's a lot in there, right? But I want you to think for a minute what this says about Jesus, that he's the creator of all things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. They were created by him, through him, and for him, for his pleasure, for his glory. I mean, just think about the immensity of the universe. We don't know, I mean, we make up measurements for how to measure the heavens. An astronomical unit, you know what, you know what an astronomical unit is? An astronomical unit is 93 million miles. It's the distance between the center of the earth to the center of the sun. So someone figured out that's 93 million miles, and things are so big, we, we can't use, you know, miles or yards or meters or something like that. Let's just take this measurement and call it an astronomical unit, and we will use that to measure how far apart things are. 93 million miles is an astronomical unit, which pales in comparison to a light year, not buzz, light year, an actual light year, Actually, this, this is, this is kind of weird. This, you could win some trivia contest with this, okay? The number of astronomical units in a light year is roughly the same number as the number of inches in a mile. A light year is huge. Light travels at a speed of, scientists help me out, 186,000 Miles per second, right? Not miles per hour, miles per second. That's pretty fast, okay? If you do the math, how many seconds go to a minute, an hour, a day, a year, and you multiply that by 186,000 to figure out how far light travels within a year? Have you done the math in your head? If you did, it's about 6 trillion, okay? 6 trillion miles, roughly, is a light year. Mind blown. Well, we can't fathom that distance. And tonight when you go outside and you look up at stars, you will see stars that may be four or five, six hundred light years away, which means that when you look up, you don't see the light of that star. You see the light that left that star back in the 1400s, traveling at a speed of 186,000 miles per second, and it took that long to reach our eyes. Do, do, do you understand the immensity of God's creation. And when we read that the heavens declare the glory of God, this, this makes sense to me, that here's Jesus, and, and, and don't miss this, this was written about 30 years after Jesus walked on the earth. Can you imagine thinking about someone who lived 30 years ago and say, you know, he is the one who created all things and they're by him and, and through him. And, and This is phenomenal that you would say this about someone who lived 30 years ago. But it, it, you look at the heavens and you see the supremacy of Christ. That he spoke and this happened. And not only is he the creator. And not only do all things exist, not only through him, but for him for his glory, for his pleasure. He's also the sustainer that holds all things together. The reason the earth stays 93 million miles away from the sun is because Jesus is holding all things together. The reason electrons are buzzing around a nucleus is because Jesus holds all things together. The reason we are 
observing the laws of gravity this morning and not floating off into oblivion is because Jesus is holding all things together. The reason there are like electronic synapses firing off in your brain that allow you to see, hear, and understand the Word of God this morning is because Jesus is holding all things together. And if he ever decided, I'm going to take a nap for an hour and stop doing this, we're we're just going to go into chaos and destruction. Because he is the one, this is the supremacy of Christ over all of creation. He's the image of the invisible God, the pre-existent God, the Son. He is the first and greatest over all of creation because everything that was made in heaven and on earth, the, the visible, the invisible, all of the rulers and authorities, they were all created by him and through him and for him. And he's the one that is holding all of this together. He is supreme over creation. But as we keep reading, this great Jesus that is supreme over creation also is supreme over the new creation, the church. Let's keep reading. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Oh, Bridge Church, I want you to catch this. He's the head of the body, the one who holds all of the universe together is the one who holds the church together. This is his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And as churches, we go through seasons where pastors come, pastors go. You just came out of 15 months or so without having a pastor. But you know what? You never lost your head. (laughs) Because a pastor is never the head of the church. And I, I say this being both very humbled and honored to be able to stand in this position this morning. But I understand this will never be my church. This is never, I'm never the head of a church. I'm a servant, a co-laborer that comes along with us and we as a body are the church. But Jesus The risen Christ, the one who reigns supreme over all creation, the one who reigns supreme over the church, he is the head of the church. And and, and go with this metaphor for a minute. He's the head of the body. I mean, that's different than saying he reigns over. Because when you are the head of the body, you are connected. You are in relationship. You, You are giving life. You are giving direction. You are giving wisdom. Everything flows through the head. And so so this is what's happening here. Jesus is not just off in the distance somewhere saying, hey, I'm in charge of this little church here. He's saying, I am connected. I am the head of this body. This is great news. (laughs) And that the one who holds all things together, the Lord over all creation, is the head of of his body, the church, even the church here in Newberry Park, even the Bridge Church. Jesus is the head, giving life, giving direction, keeping us. And, and look what he goes on to say. As he, he moves from there, he's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. Again, remember, b- first and greatest. He's the beginning, but he's also the greatest. He's overall the firstborn from the dead. We see this again, don't we? The, this idea of the firstborn, this time from the dead. So in in one sense, it's saying through his resurrection, this is where we ultimately see the supremacy of Christ. But as the firstborn from the dead, remember, first and greatest, it points to a future resurrection, that Jesus was the firstborn from the dead, which implies there will be more that will be resurrected, and it points to the end times when we will stand before Jesus as the King of kings, the, the, the judge of all, the Lord of all, that there's a time coming, that in all things, that in everything, he would be preeminent. You get to the empty tomb, and it points to the throne. It points to the time when we will stand and share in his glory as his children and stand before him. 
that in everything he might have supremacy, in everything he might be preeminent, in everything people would know and recognize and worship him as the most important because the most important thing about us is that we realize he is the most important. Unfortunately, there are many people that that haven't grasped this. Paul would later write that the God of this world has blinded the eyes of those who do not believe so that they have not seen the glory of of the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. And not only people who have not yet believed, but I think even within the church, sometimes we lose sight of who Jesus is, of the supremacy of the risen Christ. We moved to California in 2002 to work with college students. Now that was Suddenly, 2002 seems like a long time ago. But back then, there was a T-shirt. See if you remember this. A lot of people wore it. It had a, a, a face of Jesus on the shirt, and then it had these words, Jesus is my homeboy. Anybody remember those? Jesus is my homeboy. And, and, and then we come out with all these novelty items. They're, they're often called Jesus junk. And you can find these. If, if nothing else, Google Jesus junk and you'll be, not now, I see some of you reaching, just, but Google Jesus junk sometime, you'll be amazed what all, for example, you can get a, a, a Jesus piggy bank, okay, it's got a little scene with Jesus, a little slot in the top where you put your money in, do you know why they make Jesus piggy banks, are you ready for this, exactly, because Jesus saves, you can buy the Answer Me Jesus. The Answer Me Jesus, if you remember the magic eight ball, it's this, except it's Jesus. So it's a figure of Jesus, and you ask him a question, and then you shake him up, turn him upside down, and out of, you, know, you look at his feet, and this little dice comes up with divine direction to the answer of your question. This is Jesus junk, okay? My favorite one is the Jesus toaster where they have arranged the heating elements so that every slice of bread that pops out of this has the face of Jesus on your toast. And and you know what it's going to say on the box, right? I am the bread of life. And give us this day our daily bread. Here's the problem. Jesus is not your homeboy. Jesus is not a piggy bank or a magic eight ball or a toaster. He is the one who reigns supreme over all of creation. He is the one who is holding all things together. He is the head of his body, the church. He has risen from the grave. All of time points towards a future resurrection where he will receive the glory, where he will be preeminent, and every knee will bow and tongue confess that he is Lord. And you see this all through Scripture from the very beginning of Scripture. Adam and Eve sin, and, and, and what do we read? This promise that the seed of the woman, there will be a descendant of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. David, there will be a descendant of yours always reigning on the throne, pointing to the supremacy of Christ. There were promises and prophecies about a Messiah who was going to be born. He would be born of a virgin. He would be born in, in, in Bethlehem. He would be a suffering servant, but by his stripes, we would be healed because he is supreme. And you get to the, the New Testament and you begin to see Jesus revealed that in the beginning, he is the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He, he was in the beginning with God. And you keep working through this passage and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have beheld his glory. The glory is of the only son of God, full of grace and truth. And and the prophet Simeon would hold baby Jesus in his arms and said, this baby, he proclaimed, will be a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of his people Israel. Jesus comes out of the water of baptism and the Father God from heaven shouts out, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then Jesus stands in in the synagogue and he reads a scroll and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and to proclaim liberty to the captives and give sight to the blind blind and freedom for the oppressed. And we see his authority through his entire life as, as he walks around and sick people are healed and lepers are cleansed, storms are still, demons are cast out. Funerals come to a screeching halt as he says, little boy, get up, you are alive. And, and, and there's so much rejoicing from this widow. And then his 
glory and supremacy is ultimately seen as he walks triumphantly out of his own tomb and then ascends to the right hand of the Father where he sits down and waits for all of his enemies to be made a footstool that he can just prop his feet on. We see Jesus, the risen Christ, sending the Spirit to empower his people for effective mission. Jesus shows up on the road to Damascus and captures Paul with his grace, and then Jesus stands up for Stephen as he's being martyred. Paul would go on to write that, that, that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And our only hope is that Christ in you is your hope and glory and that we have been seated with him in heavenly places and all the spiritual blessings in the heavenlies are ours because we are in Christ as he lavished his grace upon us. You get to Hebrews and, and, and you see there that he is the exact representation of the divine nature and he is the perfect sacrifice we need no more sacrifices he is the great high priest who not only sympathizes with our weakness because he's tempted in every way we are but does not sin but he's also the great high priest who sat down because the work is over he accomplished it all through his supreme sacrifice on the cross and then you get to the book of revelation and you see them weeping because there is no one worthy to open the scroll. And then they look to the throne and there's one looking like a lamb that has been slain. And he is the one who is worthy to open the scroll. And thousands upon thousands cry out and say, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive honor and glory and wealth and wisdom and power and dominion and authority. Listen, Jesus is not your homeboy. <laughs> He's not a novelty item. He's the king of kings the Lord of Lords, and this is how he has revealed himself to us in his word. And the most important thing about us is that we realize that he is the most important thing. Let, let's keep moving in this. He goes on to say, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. I, I love to keep unpacking this. Paul will say in the next chapter that he's the fullness of deity in bodily form. He is all of God taking on humanity, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, that he's going to make all things new. And then this next verse, making peace by the blood of the cross. I mean, it, those last two words seem out of place, don't they? Blood cross? I mean, he, Paul has spent the, the previous verses talking about how all things were created by him and through him and for him. That in all things, he might have preeminence. That he's the first and the greatest. And what you don't expect is to get to the end and read about blood and a cross. And I think to understand this, we're going to move now into how we respond to the supremacy of Christ, because this is where the blood and the cross make sense as we move into the next part. Then the, we'll see two ways to respond. One is to be reconciled to God. This is where this passage takes us. This is all possible because of the blood of the cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. How do we respond? Well, by placing our faith in what God has done. Notice it's God who took the initiative. It is God who has reconciled us to himself. It's something we are incapable of doing. It took the blood of Jesus on the cross in order for us to be reconciled to God. And, and, and reconciliation is a great word because it's relational. Reconciliation isn't a, a declaration or, or just saying you're forgiven. It's, it's moving into a relationship with each other. You, you reconcile two groups that are in disagreement with each other, and they're, they're, they're reconciled into relationship. The relationship is restored. This is what God has done. And isn't it interesting that he took the initiative? Because normally... If, if you wrong someone, and I, I mentioned my older brother, growing up, we fought like brothers. And I would often get really mad 
and if I couldn't hurt him, I would go break something that was his, right? That, that's how you think when you're nine. And he's 12. He's faster. I'm bigger than him now. He doesn't bother me anymore. But anyway, <laughs> I'm dealing with it, dealing with it. If I broke something that was his, guess who doesn't get allowance until it's paid for? Not him. It's me. I did something wrong, and so I pay for it. If you go out and break the law, if you, if you go out and get a speeding ticket, you have to pay for that because you are the one who offended. But look what happened here. We are the ones who are alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, but it is God who sent his son who went to the cross and shed his blood so that we can be forgiven. I mean, this is grace that we are the offending party, but God is the one who took the initiative to restore this relationship. And and notice the transition. We were, as Christ followers, we were those who were alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, but he is going to present us holy and blameless because we have been placed in Christ. So the, the first response to seeing who Christ is and seeing what he's done for us is to be reconciled. Just respond in faith saying, God, I, I, I trust that what Jesus did on the cross is enough for me to be forgiven. And so I surrender to you. I trust you. But look what happens as we keep reading. If, you don't expect to see if in there. This is what God has done. He has reconciled us. He'll present us blameless. If indeed you continue in the faith stable and steadfast. These are words that describe a a secure building or a house. Stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Doesn't it sound like he's saying that it's kind of up to us? That's what it sounds like. God reconciled you, and he will present you if... But let's think about that. What do we know from Scripture? We know from Scripture that we are placed in Christ and we are kept by the power of God. We know from Scripture that we are given the Holy Spirit, sealed with the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of our inheritance. We know through Scripture that if we are in Christ, we will continue and be stable and steadfast. But I want you to think of it this way. If it is true that because of the power of God and the work of the Holy Spirit, if it is true that we will continue in the faith, it is also true that we must continue in the faith. Are you with me there? It is true that we are kept by God. We will continue in the faith if we have been placed in Christ, if we have given our lives to him, if God's spirit lives within us, we will continue in the faith. But the other side of that is that if it's true that we will continue, it's also true we must continue. That we must continue to walk in faith. We can because of the power of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. He keeps us in Christ. Nothing will snatch us out of his hand. But it's also true from our perspective that we must continue in the faith. And this is where this whole passage, I think, comes together. Because then we start asking, how do we continue in the faith? In the midst of crises that would cause us to doubt, in the midst of complacency that causes us to grow numb, and in the midst of a culture that drives us away, how then do we continue in the faith? I think the answer is found in this passage. The answer is found in the supremacy of Christ. That in times of crisis where we're so tempted to doubt and question, we lift our eyes to the glory of who Jesus is and we realize that he reigns above whatever we're going through and we continue in our faith. And in our complacency where we just go through the motion so many times for so many years of following Jesus and we want to grow numb, what do we do? We lift our eyes and see the supremacy of Christ and realize that this is fresh and exciting and his glory is is amazing. And, And we just continually stand in awe of who he is and move out of this complacency. And when the culture wants to lure us away from devotion to Christ, we lift our eyes to the supremacy of Christ to see who he is And we realize that he is far greater. He is first and the greatest. 
reigning above anything that would capture the affections of our hearts away from him. And we come back to worship. Listen, I'm so excited about where the Lord is going to take us as a church. But I believe this is the starting point. It's exciting to have a new pastor, but listen, it's not about me. It's about Jesus, who is the head of the church, about his glory, his supremacy. And the most important thing for each of us and for us as a church is that Jesus is the most important. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. This has been an awesome time of just sitting at the feet of the supreme one, of the most important one, to to just look and exalt the name of Jesus this morning. We recognize your glory, your majesty, that you alone are worthy of our worship and our praise. And Father, as we now transition into a time of just singing the glory of who Jesus is, that you will be pleased with our response. That as we just cry out from our hearts of gratitude and worship, we recognize that Jesus is supreme, most important, preeminent, and we worship you this morning. Father, I do pray if there's one here this morning or others here this morning that have not yet come to the place of of placing their faith in, in, in Jesus Christ, that you would take this word, this amazing message of reconciliation, that you took the initiative to draw us into relationship with you. Father, would you give them the courage just to respond, just to cry out and say, Father God, I know that I've sinned and I accept your forgiveness and I want to live for you. Would you do that work in the lives of people? And Father, if there are some of us here this morning that maybe we're feeling in the midst of crisis, we're we're questioning your goodness, or in the midst of, we've just grown complacent and stale in our walk with you, or, or maybe we just find the culture pulling us away. Father, I just pray that in the midst of that, taking a few minutes to focus on the supremacy of Christ would just draw us back into a vibrant walk with you so that we would continue in the faith. Thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.